In this lecture, I want to talk about four different theories of similarity. And in the course of this, we'll talk about how you can measure similarity and how we can account for the calculation of similarity with a computational model. So the four theories I want to talk about, and I talk about these in the textbook as well, are the geometric model. This is a model that's built on the idea that psychological similarity has some overlap with a geometric or arithmetic uh, distance in the real world. Uh, then I want to talk about some alternatives to that geometric approach. Uh, the first of these is the contrast model. Uh, the second is an alignment model. And the third is a transformational model. Uh, so let's talk about each one. Uh, this will probably take about 10 or 15 minutes for the first, uh, and then we'll discuss uh, the other three. The first model I want to talk about is this geometric model. And this is the one that I talk about first uh, in the textbook. The core assumption, or one of the core assumptions, of the geometric model is that similarity, so psychological similarity, is represented or can be represented in a psychological space. And that psychological space is analogous to physical space. So in this psychological space, similarity is the inverse of distance. Uh, now, in physical space, uh, we know what distance is. If you're sitting at a desk, uh, so let's suppose I'm kind of imagining you're sitting at your desk while you're watching this. Uh, I'm sitting at my desk while I'm recording it. Uh, and I can see that I'm a certain distance away from the computer monitor. Maybe it's about, uh, it's about a foot away, okay? Uh, so I've got some distance between me and the computer monitor. I can put my face closer to it. There's less distance, right? The closer I get, the smaller that distance is. Uh, in psychological space, the idea is that the closer the objects are in whatever metric that you use to assign similarity, so more features or more perceptual overlap, those things get closer in psychological space. They're nearer to each other in your conceptual space. So this is the inverse of distance. Things that are close uh, are similar. Things that are psychologically far are not similar. Uh, so this idea of similarity is the inverse of distance. Once you make that assumption, you can start to think about how things work in three-dimensional physical space and imagine that you can have a multi-dimensional psychological space. Uh, so one of the ways we can do this is to ask people to engage in a similarity rating task. So a similarity rating task is when uh, subjects or participants in an experiment are shown pairs of objects, pairs of things, and they're asked to rate usually on a scale of one to seven, uh, how similar they are to each other. Let's just look at uh, three quick examples and we can highlight how this might work. So here are two uh, cartoon fish. Uh, they don't look like real fish. These are cartoon fish that I think I've used in an experiment a few years ago where we were asking kids to learn uh, new concepts uh, or new categories of fish. Uh, one of the things we can do is we can ask uh, people to rate how similar they are. Well, I don't know how similar they are. We have no idea uh, what participants or subjects or uh, people would use uh, to determine similarity in cartoon fish. So the only way we can do this is to present a lot of them and just get their impression. So what number would you assign to this if one is not similar at all and seven is very similar? Well, it's the first one you've seen. Uh, maybe you just take a look at what they share. So they have the same lips. Uh, they have the same stripe, the same eye, the same dorsal fin, and the same tail, but one is shorter and wider, the other one's longer uh, and thinner. So I guess I would probably give this a five or a six. They're kind of similar to each other. Uh, and maybe on the next slide, so on this pair, uh, there's more features that mismatch. Uh, the two fish have different fins, they have different shapes, they have different markings on their sides. Uh, one has uh, a sharp nose, the other one has uh, sort of the rounder lips. So maybe we would give these a lower number, maybe like two or something like that. So imagine that you would see lots of pairs of these. Uh, and as you see lots of pairs of these, uh, you start to figure out how to assign high numbers to the ones that are very similar to each other. Uh, in other words, close to each other in psychological space, and low numbers to ones that are far from each other in psychological space. Uh, and that would give us an idea which dimensions, and in this case dimension, refers to those features that vary. So fin is a dimension in this case. Marking is a dimension in this case. We can figure out which dimensions people pay attention to when they consider the psychological space and the similarity of these objects.
But how can we do this mathematically? Well, that's where we turn to a, a technique called multidimensional scaling. So multidimensional scaling is a technique where we can use a mathematical formula to determine what aspects or what features or what dimensions of some objects people use when they determine how similar they are to each other. Now, this multidimensional scaling algorithm or this multidimensional scaling technique relies on the assumption of the geometric model. We're assuming that psychological space is analogous to physical space. And if it's analogous to physical space, then if things are far from each other, they're dissimilar. And if they're close to each other, they're similar. In other words, similarity is the inverse of distance in psychological space. Uh, now, one of the things make my... I'm trying to make this laser pointer show up so that I can uh, point. If it doesn't show up, I'm talking as if it is on the screen, uh, and I hope that it shows up on the screen. But I'm kind of new to recording these videos just like... Uh, a lot, of, a lot of professors are, so I'm doing my best here. I think I've got a laser pointer up here so that I can uh, point to some things on the screen. So let me just take a quick pause here uh, and point out that from time to time we're going to talk about uh, mathematical formulas uh, in this class. Uh, so these are models or computational formula that show how things happen in the mind. Uh, so this is a particular model that shows how similarity might be calculated uh, in your mind and brain. Uh, now, I'm not going to ask you to use these formulas, so you don't have to memorize them and calculate something with them. I'm not going to ask you to calculate the similarity between two objects. But I do want you to understand how these formula work, and I want you to be able to recognize them if you see them. Uh, so I'm going to go through this in a little bit of detail. It's one of the reasons I wanted my laser pointer to come up. Uh, so at the top, you see there are two fish, uh, and these are the two fish that are not very similar to each other. In the middle, you see a mathematical formula uh, that shows calculating some absolute difference or distance between two things, uh, summing, taking it to an exponent, and then uh, going across all the features or dimensions, taking it to another exponent, uh, and then calculating this distance between i and j. So if we want to calculate the distance between two objects in psychological space, and here is object i and object object j. So we want to get the distance between these two things. Uh, the dimensions of this object are given by the k value here. So the way we do that is how you probably did it when we were looking at them on the previous two slides, trying to figure out how to rate these things. Uh, we take the object uh, for the object for uh, i and k, that's every dimension on fish i, uh, and every dimension on fish k and we subtract them. So do they share the same uh, tail? Well, yes, so the subtraction there is zero because they're the same, right? Do they share the same fin? Well, the subtraction there gives you a higher number because they do share, or they don't share the same fin. So when they share something, you're getting a zero. When they don't share something, you're getting some number higher than zero. The more numbers higher than zero, the higher that value is going to be because the greater the distance is going to be between those two things. Uh, each one of these dimensions, uh, we've got n, we start at 1, and there's n dimensions. So these are five-dimensional fish because there are five different features that are varying. Uh, we're going to take the absolute value, take it to an exponent, and sum across these things in order to get the complete distance. So I keep mentioning this exponent. What about this exponent? The exponent is important for a few reasons. So this exponent r tells us what kind of similarity we want to calculate. It turns out there's two kinds of similarity, uh, or two kinds of similarity formulas. It's the same formula, but it changes a little bit depending on how we perceive the object. So this exponent r, which you see here and you see here, uh, corresponds to the use of two kinds of psychological space. Uh, so I want to consider two different kinds of ways that objects might be represented in a psychological mental space. One of these assumes uh, that the objects live in Euclidean space, and the other assumes that they live in city block space. Uh, so what's the difference between Euclidean and city block space? Let me show you uh, with a diagram or a, a map that literally shows some city blocks. So suppose uh, here we are in uh, Central Park. Uh, this is in Island of Manhattan. Uh, this is in the upper uh, west side of 
is this the Upper West Side? Yeah, this is the Upper West Side of Central Park. I don't live in New York City, so I don't really know. Um, and this is uh, a location here on the star uh, and another location uh, marked with a star. So these are two points. Uh, there are two ways to calculate how far those two points are from each other. Okay, uh, So we're just talking about physical distance now. But I want you to think about how this might work uh, in an internal mental space. But in physical distance, there are two ways to calculate the distance between those two stars. One of them is shown on the next slide. We just fly straight across. So the absolute Euclidean distance between these two points can be given by a straight line. Uh, and that's it's even a saying, right? The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Well, there it is. There's the shortest distance between two points, which is a straight line. Uh, but of course, that's not how you would get to those two points, right? If you were here, uh, you would not be able to travel this way unless uh, you were able to, some, unless there was a direct pathway under the ground uh, or some way to vault over these buildings, right? So you can't really get there. So that's the shortest space. It's Euclidean, uh, and you probably recognize this as the hypotenuse of a right triangle, so you know it's the shortest distance. But it, you can see where the right triangle would be. Right? So this Euclidean distance is the shortest distance, but it's not one that you can use. If you or I were trying to uh, move from this corner to this corner, uh, we would probably take a city block space. Right? So this is literally a city block where we walk in one direction, turn uh, 90 degrees, turn the corner, and walk up the sideway here. So you know the difference between uh, the uh, sides of a right triangle and the hypotenuse of a right triangle. If you add these two together, it's longer. Uh, so it's going to take you longer. This is a longer distance, but it's not the shortest distance between the two points, but it's the distance that's practical for you as a pedestrian on the street or a driver on the street. So there are two ways to calculate the distance. One is giving you a longer number or a higher number than the other. So what does this have to do with psychological space? Well, it turns out there are uh, two kinds of ways to calculate distance in psychological space. And it depends on the kind of stimulus or the kind of object you're looking at. One of the things that you should note here is that uh, we can label these streets. We can recognize the cross streets uh, directly. Okay, So let's think about that as we look at the next uh, slide. So here are three kinds of objects that you might be able to calculate pairwise similarity. Uh, the first are these fish that we've seen before. Uh, for the fish that we've seen before, uh, you can count the dimensions, right? You can label them and perceive them separately. You can perceive the length, the color, you know, the pattern on the side, the fin, the tail, the lip, and so on. So you can label these things, you can perceive them separately, and if only one of them changes, and here's one where there's only a single change. Uh, you can tell and perceive that single change separately, uh, just like you could perceive streets separately. Each one of those streets can only be walked down. Uh, you can only walk down one of those streets at a time, right? So that's a separable dimension. In the city block space, things are separable. Uh, so when do we assume Euclidean and city block space? Uh, well, we would assume to use city block space when these dimensions are perceptually separable. For the fish, the dimensions or the features are able to be perceived separately. For this set of stimuli here, uh, if you were asked to calculate how similar these two patterns are to each other, uh, you could do it. They look very similar to each other, but you notice there are two things that vary. Uh, there's the uh, light and dark band, you can see that this one is just a little bit thicker, right? There are uh, fewer light and dark bands in the space uh, compared to this one. Uh, they're also at an angle, so you, if these varied by angle, you could perceive that angle separately. So although these don't seem as clear-cut or as easily labelable labelable or describable as the fish, uh, you can still see that you would be able to recognize the change in spatial frequency of light and dark bands or orientation of the light and dark bands in a separable way. If only one of them changes, you could recognize that change. For the color shapes at the bottom, though, you can see that those are different from each other, right? One is darker, the other one's lighter, uh, but there are other differences as well. Uh, so when colors are compared, 
uh, they change or they vary in terms of uh, hue and saturation and brightness uh, or things like that. One of the things that uh, seems to be true about color changes, and this is also true about different kinds of sounds and lots of other stimuli, uh, is that when one aspect changes, so if I just change the brightness or the hue or the saturation, you can tell that something's been changed, but you can't tell exactly which one of those was changed. Uh, it might be very difficult to perceive a single dimension separately. Uh, in other words, if I change a feature on the fish, you can tell which feature has changed. If I change a feature on these color patterns, you can tell there's a difference, but you don't know exactly which one. So, sure, this looks darker, uh, but this could also be a change of uh, color saturation. We don't know whether it's brightness or color saturation or some combination of the two. So when people perceive things that have features that can be labeled and perceived separately, they tend to perceive them and calculate similarity in a way that assumes there's a city block metric. But when those things can't be separated, so when they can't perceive the dimensions separately, their similarity calculations seem to respect that Euclidean space, in other words, the diagonal. I want you to keep that in mind because in a few slides we're going to come back to some occasional violations of uh, this assumption. In other words, sometimes people, uh, because they assume city block space, it looks as if uh, they're not uh, making assumptions or making similarity judgments according to uh, geometric and psychological space uh, locations. So keep this in mind. This is going to come back uh, when we talk about triangle triangle inequality in a few slides. So once you've done some multidimensional scaling, you've asked people to uh, compare things, uh, compare stimuli or compare objects, uh, and rate them on similarity. Uh, you can often plot this uh, solution using those formula in multidimensional space. So for example, suppose we asked people uh, to, and I discussed this in the textbook, suppose we asked people to compare different kinds of birds. And for each one of these birds, and it could be a picture of the bird or it can just be the, the name of the bird, uh, we ask people to rate on a scale of 1 to 7 how similar they are to each other. And what you would find, of course, is that when people are uh, asked to compare robins and sparrows, so here's the robin, here's the sparrow, uh, they give it a high number because robins and sparrows are kind of similar to each other. They have similar functions, they live in similar ways, they're in your backyard, they're small, uh, maybe you have a bird feeder or something like that. So a lot of these birds here are similar to each other. Uh, similarly, or maybe I shouldn't use the word similarly, uh, in the same way, uh, if you saw a goose and a chicken, you might give it a high uh, rating for similarity because goose and chicken and duck are kind of similar to each other. Uh, if you were asked to compare eagle and duck, you might give those a very low number. They're not very similar to each other. So this is a representation of someone's psychological space or their conceptual space for birds. Uh, and what it seems to show is that some things cluster close together. Uh, these are things that were given high ratings for similarity, and they have low distance. Goose, chicken, and duck are close to each other in psychological space. People rate them as being similar. Robins, sparrows, cardinals, and blue jays are close to each other in psychological space because people give them high rankings for similarity. Cardinal and goose are far from each other in psychological space, or at least relatively far from each other in psychological bird space because people give them lower numbers. I've shown animal and bird on here too because sometimes in a similarity rating task we ask how similar a goose is to an animal, how similar a cardinal is to an animal, how similar a hawk is to a bird, and that sort of thing. And what you find is that these things kind of cluster around bird. We think of pigeons and parrots and robins as birds. We tend to think of goose and chickens, although they're birds, we also think of them as being a little bit closer to the animal concept. So with these objects in psychological space, uh, what do you notice about this? We have two dimensions. And these two dimensions might not be labeled by the person. So the person might not say, well, when I rate the similarity of pigeon to parrot, I consider two dimensions. I consider the domesticity of the animal and the size of the animal. They probably don't say that. They may not even be aware of that. But when you collect enough ratings and you use those collected ratings to generate a multidimensional scaling solution, 
what you find is that there seem to be two dimensions that account for most of these similarity ratings. And these two dimensions, uh, we, can, we can label or we can uh, infer from that that one of those dimensions is how domestic the bird is. So things that are raised uh, for you know chickens and goose, their farmyard, uh, or they live in domestic areas, uh, they may be uh, on this side of the boundary. Whereas things like eagle, uh, we don't have domestic eagles, right? I mean, eagles and hawks and blue jays. I mean, sure, blue jays might live in your backyard, but they're not really domestic at all, right? These are wild animals. These are not wild animals. Pigeons and parrots, they're not as wild, right? So these are farmyard animals. These are sort of urban pet type animals, and these are wild birds. Uh, so there's a domestic axis, axis. And when we compare things, we consider how domestic those two birds are. And of course, there's also a size with larger things on one side of the boundary, smaller things on the other side of the boundary. We never told, so when these data would be collected, uh, if people are asked to make these ratings, we don't tell them to consider these two dimensions. We don't say rank them on size, give them high numbers if they're the same size, low numbers if they're different sizes. This just seems to account uh, for their uh, performance. So this is a sim simple example. I want to show you a more complicated example on the next slide. So here's a paper that came out a few years ago, uh, it's 2017, uh, from Robert Nosofsky's lab. Uh, so Robert Nosofsky is a cognitive psychologist and a cognitive scientist uh, at Indiana University in Bloomington. Uh, and he's been around for a while working on questions of concepts and categories, how people learn new categories, and he's always taken this multidimensional scaling approach. In other words, uh, his work depends on the assumption that when people are learning new concepts or new classifications or new categories, that those categories are represented in psychological space as it might be accounted for by this geometric model and the multidimensional scaling approach. Uh, one of the things that he noted is that uh, in an introductory geology course, uh, many people uh, have difficulty telling the difference between different kinds of rocks. Now, I don't know if you've ever taken a course in uh, earth science or geology, uh, but you probably did something like that maybe in secondary school if you haven't uh, in university. Uh, and you know there's different kinds of rocks, right? There are sedimentary rocks, there are igneous rocks, and there are metamorphic rocks. Uh, and of course there's other subtypes, but those are the main types of rocks. Now, do you know what the difference is between them? Well, most people kind of know what the difference is. Uh, they know that igneous rocks are volcanic and that uh, sedimentary rocks are sandstone type rocks based on compressed sediment and that metamorphic rocks uh, are some combination uh, of heat and sediment. Uh, but the problem is they look, they don't really look very much like each other. So he was trying to figure out how do people learn to make these distinctions? So when people go into a geology course, how do they first learn these igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rock distinctions? So let's look at what they did. One of the things they were interested in was coming up with the conceptual space. In other words, what dimensions allow you to make those distinctions? So uh, in one of their studies, uh, they took photographs of rocks obtained from web searches. Uh, they included uh, one representative token for each of the 30 subtypes. I'll show you on the next slide the subtypes of rocks. Uh, each rock picture was a square, uh, seven subtended a visual angle that tells you how far back from the uh, monitor uh, you would sit, uh, stimuli displayed on a gray background on a CRT monitor. Uh, so basically they're showing pictures of rocks uh, on slides uh, for participants. And on each trial, uh, they had 435 unique pairs and they made a similarity rating for uh, one extremely dissimilar and nine extremely similar. So your job, if you were a subject in this experiment, was to see pictures of two rocks, 435 of them, uh, and just make a rating. And Presumably, you didn't have any idea uh, what these rocks were. You weren't trying to distinguish them, so you weren't asked to say what kind of rock it is. Is it granite or is it marble? You weren't asked to say anything about its igneous or metamorphic or sedimentary status. Uh, you were just asked to rank them on similarity. Uh, so here's the kind of rocks they used. Uh, if you know anything about rocks, you might recognize some of these. Uh, I don't really know anything about rocks, so some of these I recognize, some of them I don't. But they've got a category of igneous rocks. So 
uh, things like granite uh, and pumice uh, and uh, andesite. Uh, so these are igneous rocks that are volcanic in nature. They've got metamorphic uh, rocks, uh, which things like slate, for example, are metamorphic or anthracite. Uh, and they have sedimentary rocks, uh, things uh, like different kinds of sandstone, shale, uh, rock salt, and so on. So you see these in pairs, and you rate them on a similarity. Uh, and what they determined was that there seemed to be three different dimensions, uh, or four different dimensions, depending on which model they fit. Let's look at that on the next slide. So here is a multidimensional scaling solution. This shows you the psychological conceptual space of all of those kinds of rocks, the 30 different kinds of rocks of the three subtypes. Uh, and the spheres, the circles, uh, represent the igneous rocks, the cubes represent the metamorphic rocks, and the diamonds represent the sedimentary rocks. And what you can see is that the categories, the types of rocks, are interspersed. They're not very well delineated. There are lots of uh, sedimentary rocks that might look like metamorphic rocks and so on. Uh, but what they determined is that when people make these similarity uh, calculations, they pay attention to some features. One of those features is saturation. In other words, how light or dark are the rocks? Uh, things that are similarly light or similarly dark will be grouped together in psychological space because they're given a high similarity rating. Another one is lightness. Uh, is it a light rock uh, or is it a dark rock? And another one is grain size. Grain size means something that's really smooth, uh, like uh, obsidian. It's kind of glass-like smoothness. Uh, or sort of a coarse, flaky uh, granite uh, that has big chunks or grains in it. Uh, all of those seem to distinguish between these different kinds of rocks. The one thing that doesn't seem to be very good uh, is whether or not it's uh, sedimentary, whether or not it's igneous, or whether or not it's metamorphic. So there are clusters across the entire psychological space. Here's a different solution. They also fit a four-dimensional solution. Four dimensions have to be shown on two two-dimensional graphs because there's no way to show four-dimensional space uh, on a screen. So you can see that there are the same rocks appearing in both uh, plots. So here you have grain size with grainy things up here. Uh, here's granite, uh, brescia, and diorite being shown. Uh, and here's non-grainy rocks uh, like obsidian, which is very smooth and shiny. Uh, so these things are given high ratings, high similarity ratings. These things are given high similarity ratings. And these things, if you compare these two rocks, they would be not very similar. We've also got a lightness with light rocks like light marble here and dark things like coal and obsidian on this side. Uh, they also noted uh, that there is a saturation, uh, so things that are uh, densely saturated in colors versus things that are sort of grayish without much color uh, is something that people use when they uh, rate the similarity. And finally, organization seems to also account for some of your conceptual space. Things like slate uh, might have a certain kind of organization, uh, which is linear. So slate is kind of flaky. Shale is kind of flaky. Uh, and things like uh, brescia, salt, uh, and uh, conglomerate, for example, are uh, blocky. They're put together uh, with sort of grains. So it's not the grain size, but it's a particular organization. These things have chunks. These things have slices. Uh, so what they found is that people have no idea <laughs> how to tell the difference between igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, and sedimentary rocks. But people do have strong uh, assumptions or strong uh, opinions on the lightness, the grain size, the organization, and the saturation of these rocks. That doesn't seem to tell you what kind of rock they are, but it is something that we pay attention to when we see them. And we can plot this in psychological space. One of the things about psychological space is that it makes the assumption that there's a physical analog to it. In other words, uh, obsidian is on one side and this granite is on the other side. These things are far from each other in psychological space. And if they're far from each other in psychological space, uh, it should take you longer uh, to make judgments, for example, about obsidian and granite. Uh, you should notice confusion between coal and obsidian because they're close to each other. If you see one, you might make a mistake, right? So if these objects are in psychological space in the same way they are in physical space, some of these assumptions should hold true. Uh, and there are three assumptions I want to talk about. 
Let me talk about them here first, and then I'll label them on the next. Uh, first is every time you see obsidian, can't be anything closer to obsidian, right? Uh, if this object is here in physical space on this location of the uh, plot, uh, there's nothing closer to it than itself, right? Just like there's nothing closer to you than yourself. Uh, so this means that there's some kind of minimal distance. Obsidian is minimally distant from itself. Uh, also, another thing that's true in physical space is that the order of comparison shouldn't matter. There's a distance between obsidian uh, and rock salt. So we can measure this, and whether we measure it as city block distance or Euclidean distance as a straight line, uh, it shouldn't matter whether you start at obsidian and go to rock salt or start at rock salt and go to obsidian. It should be exactly the same line. Uh, and then finally, uh, if there's straight lines, there should also be triangles. Uh, and if there are triangles, that means that the hypotenuse of the right triangle should be the shortest line. Uh, so if we want to calculate the distance uh, between obsidian and slate, it should be a shorter distance than the, dis the distance between obsidian, micrite, and slate. So this line here should be shorter than the sum of these two lines. Those are basic geometric assumptions that work in basic geometry that you probably learned in uh, primary school. But turns out we don't, psychological space doesn't always work like physical space. So these are three core assumptions of this psychological geometric model of uh, minimality, symmetry, and triangle inequality. Uh, these come directly out of the assumption that psychological space is an analog for physical space. Let's talk about each one of them. So minimality, that's like the obsidian is closer to itself than anything else. A thing must be closer, that is to say, more similar to itself than it is to any other object. On the left, I've shown you A colon A. That means the similarity of A to A has to be, uh, or the distance between A and A has to be lower uh, than the distance between A and B. There's nothing closer to you than yourself. Uh, the distance between two objects has to be less than or equal to the distance between these two objects. It doesn't matter if you calculate it in any way, wherever you are, uh, you have to be closer to yourself than anything else. Whatever the object is, there can't be anything closer or more similar to that object than itself. Uh, so if we ask people to you know, make pairwise comparisons of all those fish, if there's two of the same fish, they've got to be the closest thing possible, the most similar possible. Turns out this is sometimes violated when people look at things quickly. Uh, for example, if the letter S is shown twice on a screen, subjects are faster to correctly say that those two tokens are similar than if the letter W is shown twice. So by this reaction time measure of similarity, uh, and this is how quickly you can say that they are the same thing, the letter S seems to be more similar to itself than the letter W is to itself. You're probably saying this is not a big deal. Maybe it just takes you longer to recognize W. Maybe that's true, uh, but it still seems to be uh, problematic for a geometric model that two things can be more similar than two other identical things. There are other minimality violations. Uh, sometimes the letter C can be viewed as more similar to the letter O than W is to itself, uh, if you see when people make confusions. Uh, so if letters are presented really quickly, uh, people will often confuse C and O uh, more often than they will confuse W to itself. Uh, other studies have found that the letter M is more often recognized as an H than it is as an M when it's presented really quickly. So as objects, and these are simple objects, these are letters, if they're presented really quickly, uh, we can sometimes see confusions, and these confusions seem to suggest that sometimes an object can be closer to something else than it is to itself. So that's the minimality assumption. It should be true, but sometimes it isn't when things are presented really quickly. The symmetry assumption is a little bit more complicated and seems to be a little bit more problematic for a geometric model. In the symmetry assumption, uh, if things are represented in a psychological space that is analogous to a physical space, then there should be no difference between the comparison order. So the distance between object I and J should be exactly the same as the distance between J and I. But that doesn't seem to be the case. So 
comparison order seems to matter for complex things. Maybe it doesn't matter for simple things, but it does matter for complex things. And this was shown most clearly by Amos Tversky. Now, this goes back to the 1970s. Some of the terminology is a little bit dated here, so I've got a little explanation down here of that. In 1970s, uh, Americans were asked to rate uh, the similarity of different countries uh, by Tversky. And one of the things he noted is that when people were asked to say, uh, rank the similarity between North Korea and communist China, uh, they tended to differ depending on how the order question was asked. North Korea was judged to be more similar to communist China than China was to North Korea. In other words, China was the dominant country of this type. Uh, and this is particular to an era in the, in the 20th century, the Cold War era in the 1970s. Uh, the communist China government uh, was uh, perceived to be closely aligned with the former Soviet Union. Uh, and so it was seen as a communist totalitarian state, of which North Korea was also. North Korea is still kind of like that. Uh, there aren't many other countries quite like North Korea. Um, but in the 1970s, uh, most Americans viewed the Soviet Union, uh, China, and North Korea as being these types of communist totalitarian states. So North Korea is smaller, and it was less well known. China at the time was, was a much larger uh, communist state, a much more well known. So things are more like China. China isn't like North Korea, but North Korea is like China. So depending on how you ask the question, the similarity changes. In geometric space, the order shouldn't matter. But in uh, psychological space, sometimes the order does matter because you anchor on something that's more important. In this example, communist China has more gravity. Things are more similar to it uh, than North Korea. So the third violation of this geometric model is called the triangle inequality assumption. Uh, triangle inequality depends on this idea of Euclidean space and assumes that the sh a straight line connecting two points is the shortest path. And this is true whether you use city block space or, G or uh, Euclidean space. That straight line is always going to be the shortest path. Uh, but people don't always make that assumption. And when the dimensions are separable, uh, we can see some changes or some violations. So let's see how that might work. Suppose we have a psychological space. This is, an entire, this is a universe of shapes. Uh, and these shapes vary on what you can see as two different dimensions. There is a size dimension with uh, large, uh, let me get my back here, with large, medium, and small shapes. And there's a color dimension with white, pink, and red shapes. Uh, so here's an entire universe of nine shapes. And suppose we want to choose uh, five shapes, sorry, four shapes out of this group. And we're going to ask people to make uh, very simple similarity ratings. In other words, they're going to make the rating of how similar is A to B, how similar is B to C, how similar is C to B, how similar is B to D. We're going to do all the possible pairings. But what we care about in this case is the similarity of A to B, similarity of B to C, similarity of A to D, similarity of D to C. This gives us this triangle. Now, if things are in psychological space and if there is a uh, geometric assumption here, we should assume that if we calculated this distance, calculated this distance, that this line here has to be shorter than this line here, right? That would be true in actual space. So what does it actually look like? Uh, what we see here, and I've shown now, I've just gotten rid of the uh, other shapes. Here we just have the four shapes that we're concerned about, uh, is that what you would find if you ask people to do this uh, is that A and B would be given a certain rating, it's not particularly very similar, right? They mismatch on two things. Now, they may be close matches. They're closer in size. So A is closer in size to B than it is to C. Uh, and they're also close enough in color. A and B uh, are one degree away in color, and B and C are one degree away in color. So this is a one degree mismatch on one dimension, color, and a one degree mismatch on the other uh, dimension, size. A and D, on the other hand, is a two-degree mismatch in color. Uh, they're the same size, but they're very different colors. What people seem to show, though, is a real strong preference for city block space. And they seem to show a preference for single-dimensional match. 
So A and D, although they're very different colors, they're exactly the same size, and people prioritize that. If you see two shapes that are a perfect match on a feature, it seems as if people give that heavier weight. Uh, so if we were to calculate this distance, so the similarity here, the similarity here, and then the similarity of A to D, which, although they're different colors, they're the same size, and D to C, although they're different sizes, they're exactly the same colors, these dimensional matches tends to shrink the psychological distance. In other words, A and D aren't really this far from each other. They're really quite close. D is much closer here than it is to B. Uh, subjects will show that A, B, and C is a longer distance. If we were to add these psychological distances up, then A, D, and C is. Uh, so what that seems to suggest is that when there's a dimensional match, uh, people prioritize that dimensional match. If you notice that something is exactly the same, it tends to shrink psychological space. In other words, it shrinks the distance between these two things. Uh, and it shrinks the distance between these two things. Psychological space is not static. Psychological space can shrink and stretch depending on what dimensions you weight and what dimensions you pay attention to. So all three of these things, minimality, symmetry and triangle inequality should be uh, assumptions that hold true for a wide variety of stimuli if psychological space is truly analogous to physical space. But what we've shown is that sometimes people get confused if things are presented quickly or if things are presented in different orders, it may change the way in which they understand psychological space. Or if there's a dimensional match, it can stretch or shrink psychological space accordingly. So that has suggested to theorists that although this geometric model is really useful, uh, and although it gives us some insights into the nature and structure and shape of people's psychological space, it doesn't account for all of their judgments. So I want to talk about three additional models uh, in the next few slides uh, that sort of account for some of these changes. The first of these is the contrast model. Uh, Amos Tversky put forth the contrast model and suggested that when people make judgments of similarity, they take into account common features and distinctive features. Common features are those things that match. So if you want to calculate the similarity between an object A and an object B, it's given by how similar they are in terms of shared features. So these are all of the features that A and B have in common. But then you take away from it things that are unique to A. So these are the uniquely A distinctive features. These are things that A has that B does not. Uh, and these are B distinctive features. These are things that object B has that A does not. A lot of the objects we've been talking about so far have all of the same features. Those fish that I showed or those uh, patterns with the light and dark bands. They all had the same features. There was, wasn't the case where the fish had a feature in one case you know, one fish had a feature that the other one just simply didn't have. They just varied. So we were only con including this common feature end of it. Tversky suggests that sometimes if we're really more familiar with something, if we know more about something or something has unique distinctive features, we take it away from the similarity calculation. So we, the more things you have in common, the higher the similarity. But the more things that are unique, the lower the similarity. So we take away this similarity, and we take away uh, distinctive features from the overall similarity calculation. So this is still a feature-based model, just like the uh, geometric model is, but it takes into account common and distinctive features. Uh, here is a passage uh, from Tversky's uh, chapter uh, and suggests that this contract mo contrast model, which is the same formula here, uh, predicts asymmetric similarity because A is not constrained to equal B. In other words, what we know about China uh, doesn't have to be the same thing as what we know about North Korea. Maybe we know a lot more about communist China. And I say here, uh, he refers to it as red China. That was the term that was common in the 1970s uh, to refer to communist China as it was connected to Soviet powers. We don't use that term anymore. That's the term that Tversky used then because it was common then. Uh, so in North America, most people were just more familiar with China. And that's still the case. We're just more familiar uh, with China than we are with North Korea. Uh, and so A, things that are unique to, uh, unique to China, we're just more familiar with them. Uh, and so it suggests that if you ask people 
uh, to rate the similarity of something to China, you know more about it, uh, and you can uh, weight those things more heavily. China has more salient distinctive features than North Korea, and so A is greater than B. And this changes the way in which similarity is calculated. And this seems to account for this, uh, sim this violation of the symmetry assumption. Now this contrast model, just like the geometric model, is a uh, feature-based model. And there are some problems with feature-based models, and I want to show those on the next few slides. So both the geometric model and the contrast model have some difficulty accounting for the way in which we perceive features. They make the assumption that we know these features, that we perceive these features. But there are some difficulties with that. There are two main things that I want you to uh, be aware of. First of all, feature selection is flexible and context specific. So when you pay attention to the feature, it depends on how you're asked. Let me show you something on the next slide that makes this point very clearly. So this is from a study uh, from Doug Medine's work uh, on flexible similarity. Uh, and this is what's known as a uh, forced choice task. So there's a target item. Uh, this is shown by T. And when you're making similarity judgments, instead of rating them, you're asked to say which one of these two pairs is more similar to the target. So is this target more like A or is it more like B? Uh, some subjects were asked to say how similar the pairs are. Other subjects were asked to say which is the more dissimilar pairing. Uh, and what they found is that the objects in B are judged as being more similar to the target, but also more dissimilar to the target. In other words, this set is both more alike and unalike uh, than this set is. And there's a couple of reasons for that. When making a similarity judgment, uh, subjects usually point out the fact that there's uh, some uh, consistency here. In other words, these all have the same shape, and these all have the, sorry, these all have the same fill, and these all have the same fill. So internally, uh, this is more like this uh, because they're all checkerboard or they're all white. This is a little bit less similar because there are some checkerboard, some whites. However, B is also less similar to T uh, because B has no checkerboards. A still has some. So depending on how you ask, if you ask people to make a similarity judgment, uh, they like this pairing because everything is checkerboard, everything is clear. And that's not really the same kind of feature. It's not a feature that one thing possesses uh, a variation of a dimension, like our fish, uh, this is a feature that uh, is something configural. In other words, they're all the same fill, they're all the same fill. So you don't know what those are ahead of time. And so Medine's claim is that uh, how can we have a featural model if we don't know what features to take into account? This gets more complicated on the next two slides. Medine also pointed out that potential features can be high in number. Uh, they might even be infinite. We don't know what features were, are going to matter until we make a judgment. So in this same kind of forced choice paradigm, where people are asked to take a target and say how similar it is to a set of objects, Medine found that people make all sorts of uh, distinctions based on arbitrary numbers of features. So in the top slide, here's the target. It's the black square and the uh, white circle. And subjects found that it is more similar to A than it is to B. And the reason they found that it was more similar to A than to B uh, is that people would typically label things or describe things like, well, both objects have a square. Okay, So in this case, square is the relevant feature. If a, if a configuration of objects possesses a square, it's more similar to the target. In the middle, uh, people were also asked to make this distinction, and they still found that the target was more similar to the objects in uh, group A here. Uh, and here, it isn't just the presence of a square, it's the presence of a black square. So there's a black object here, but most people uh, are finding this to be the better match. Uh, there's a square here. Most people are still finding this to be the better match. So it has to be black square. Up here, square is enough. Down here, it's got to be a black square. Uh, in the bottom pairing, again, target is closer to A than it is to B in psychological space. It's more similar. Uh, and what do you think about this one? 
Uh, so what seems to make uh, the target more like A than it is like B? Well, people reported that it was the presence of a black object on the left side. So here, it doesn't matter that it's a square. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's black. It has to be black on the left side. And what Medine's point was that how do people even know which features to count until they start counting them? Uh, so we can't know in advance whether it's going to be the shape, the color, the configuration, uh, or some combination of them uh, until we start asking people to make uh, judgments. Now, one of the things you probably noticed about the two previous examples is that some features are configural in nature. In other words, having all shapes in a set of figures being the same fill counts as a feature. One of the ways we can account for that is by the third model of similarity that I wanted to talk about, and that is the alignment model. So in the alignment model, uh, we can conceive of similarity depending on whether or not it's a direct perceptual match or a configural relational match. And the alignment model assumes that feature comparisons are important. Uh, alignment models try to specify how and why features should count. So consider these objects here. There's a series of gray circles and a series of black circles. Uh, and people are asked to take each one of these and say how similar they are to each other. This is the target we're concerned about. Now, people are going to do all of the comparisons, but I'm going to focus on the similarity of this object here, the one that's labeled target, and whether or not it is closer to this black object or this black object. And depending on your familiarity with the objects, uh, there are two possible answers. One is the direct size match. These things are close because, remember, in a triangle inequality example, if there's a dimensional match, people like that. So these are exactly the same size. They're different colors, but they're exactly the same size, and so they are given a higher rating. Uh, it should be certainly higher than this one because they're also a different color, but they're not the same size. But when people were asked to rate or view uh, the objects within a category first, so when they were asked to see that this object and this object and this object belonged in a category, that there was a small, medium, and large one, and that this object, this object, and this object belonged in a category, that there was a small, medium, and sorry, a small, medium, and large black circle, they perceived that there were endpoints. In other words, there was a smallest gray circle and a smallest black circle. If you had some experience with the objects within the category, you noted that these, these two could be more similar to each other because within their set or within their family, family, they were the smallest of the family. That's a pretty good way to think about it. Uh, if you imagine two different families, uh, let's suppose uh, two siblings and they each have their own family. So I've got two younger brothers. We all have family. Uh, our kids are different ages. Uh, so uh, I might have a younger brother whose kids uh, are older than mine because he had kids earlier than I did, right? Uh, but there's some similarity between their youngest daughter and my youngest daughter, even though they are different uh, in age. Uh, they're both the youngest ones in the family. And that's kind of what this is getting, at a, getting into account. They might not be exactly the same size or the same age, but they're the youngest within their group. And that also seems to be an important aspect of similarity that's missed by the purely featural accounts. In this case, we need to figure out how to align the objects in order to determine similarity. So the final model I want to talk about is the transformational model. And I just want to talk briefly about this one. Uh, and that is that objects are similar if they can be transformed. In other words, if one thing can be transformed into another, uh, it has a higher degree of similarity than something that can't. And the number of steps that it takes uh, seems to correlate with how similar something is. If it takes one step to transform something, uh, then those things are more similar uh, than if it uh, takes three or four steps to transform something. Uh, I suggested water and steam, but the next uh, slide shows this a little bit more directly. Uh, you all should know what this is. This is a monarch butterfly caterpillar, right? Uh, and these are very common around this area in the summertime. Uh, they continue to eat milkweed until they're full. They then form a chrysalis in a cocoon, and they uh, turn into butterflies. And if we ask people who are familiar with the transformation 
uh, to choose the similarity, uh, they should choose these things as being more similar according to a transformational account. In other words, if you know that this is a monarch butterfly caterpillar and that this is a monarch butterfly, these things are more similar to each other than the butterfly is to the moth. Uh, the butterfly and the moth are different species. This is a transformation, right? This caterpillar turns into a butterfly. They don't look at all like each other. These things look like each other, but they are a different species. Uh, they're a different essence. And so if there is something to this transformational account, and if people do uh, rate these as being more similar to each other than these two objects, uh, then it suggests they know something about these uh, things. So I want to illustrate that on the last slide, and then I want to follow up with a few questions for you to think about. And that'll be the end of this lecture. This one seems to have gone a little bit longer, uh, but I couldn't figure out a good way to break this up into two. And that's because similarity, regardless of how you calculate it, is quite flexible. And one of my favorite experiments of all time uh, is one that was done by Lance Rips in the 1980s. Uh, and one of the things he asked his subjects to do uh, was to consider the differences between featural similarity uh, and classification. Uh, and in this particular experiment, you might be asked to consider, here's one example, uh, consider a three-inch round object. So he did this in the United States, where people use inches instead of centimeters, but a three-inch round object is about the same size as the lid of a Tim Hortons coffee cup, right? So you can sort of picture what that is. Uh, it's a circle about as big as a, a bar coaster, or as about as big as the diameter of a cup. So you got, a, you got an idea, right? So imagine holding up uh, the plastic lid from your Starbucks or your Tim Hortons coffee cup. That's your three-inch round object. So imagine that three-inch round object, and then answer the question, is that three-inch round object more similar to a quarter or a pizza? Now, U.S. quarter is exactly the same size as a Canadian quarter, uh, and it's closer to the three-inch round object, because it's about an inch across, than a pizza is, right? So pizzas are much larger than three inches. Quarters are smaller than three inches, but they're closer. And that's exactly what he found. People rated the similarity of the three-inch round object to the quarter to be higher than the similarity of the three-inch round object to the pizza. But he found out that people also didn't really think that was that important, right? So when you're asked to classify it, in other words, what category does the three-inch round object more likely belong to, no one thought it belonged to the quarter category. Uh, but people were willing to say, well, it could be a pizza, right? And that's because of, well, it's because of a few things. First of all, quarter seems to have some necessary and sufficient conditions for category membership. You can only be a quarter if you are minted by or manufactured by the appropriate government quarter issuing authorities. You got to be made by the uh, Royal Canadian Mint or the U.S. government mint, right? If you're not a quarter, it doesn't matter. Even if you're quarter size and shape, you know the difference between a real quarter and a fake quarter, right? So you either are a quarter or you are not, and it doesn't matter how close you are in perceptual space. Uh, unless you have that authority uh, of the government behind you, you can't be a, an official quarter. You could be a pizza, though, right? It might not be very similar. Three-inch round object might not be a very good pizza, certainly not a very big pizza, but if you took a bagel, put some pizza sauce on it, topped it with a little bit of cheese, put it in your uh, oven for a few minutes, you would have a pizza bagel, and it would be a pizza, right? So people thought this was more similar, but they were willing to grant that this was a more likely classification. Uh, and this kind of similarity-based calculation or similarity-based uh, concept or classification suggests that there's a lot of variability and flexibility. Okay, I want to follow this lecture up with a few things for you to think about. And the reason I want to do that is these are the kinds of questions that I'm going to ask uh, on exams. So in, multiple cho in the quizzes, there'll be multiple choices. So there might be a question like this with a multiple choice answer. But on the exam, I might ask you to write uh, a little bit more, to fill in the blank, or to come up with a definition or an explanation. So I want you to think about these questions, uh, and I'll talk briefly about them. So what are some of the reasons to study similarity? Uh, so based on what you've read, and based on what we've talked about in this lecture, what are some of the reasons? If I ask you this on a quiz, you should be answering things like, similarity is uh, closely aligned with perception. Uh, you should also be answering things uh, like, 
similarity can be a diagnostic tool. So when you answer this, uh, look back at that first lecture and look back at the corresponding section of the text when we talk about what are some reasons to study similarity and be able to list and describe them why it's important. What are the four main theories of similarity that we discussed uh, in lecture or that I discussed in the textbook? Well, those should be the same four things that we discussed in this lecture. The geometric model, uh, the contrast model, the transformational account, uh, and the alignment model. Uh, so you should be able to list them and maybe describe them briefly how they work. So what are the assumptions of these models? And that might kind of question might look like this. What are three key assumptions of the standard geometric model of similarity? Uh, so there are some key assumptions that we talked about in this lecture, uh, things that were violated. Uh, so for example, uh, the minimality assumption, the symmetry assumption, and the triangle inequality assumption. Uh, so I might ask you to name those. I might ask you to define those. I might ask you to recognize them. I might give you a definition of the uh, triangle inequality assumption and ask you to recognize what it is. And I might ask you to say how people uh, violate those. Again, short answer uh, questions. Sometimes the questions will be very straightforward, fill-in-the-blank type questions. So I might say, which one of the four theories assumes that similarity is a linear function of shared features as well as distinctive features? Uh, that is the direct uh, definition uh, of the contrast model. So sometimes I give you the definition, and I just want you to come up with the answer. Uh, this might be a fill-in-the-blank type of question. Uh, other fill-in-the-blank types of questions might be like a city block distance is used by multidimensional scaling where the dimensions are blank, uh, and you should be able to answer both of these. On the next slide, I've got two additional questions to think about, and these are not the kind of question that I would ask on the exam, but these are things that I might ask you to think about when you're integrating this information into everything else that you know. In other words, how can you apply what we learned today in this lecture uh, to, other, uh, to, to other aspects, to other classes, uh, and to how you think about the world? Uh, for example, uh, and this should remind you of the, uh, one of these will remind you of the uh, discussion forum question. So first, I say a common expression uh, is it's like comparing apples and oranges. You hear that all the time, right? It's like comparing apples and oranges. Usually that's a metaphor for comparing things that can't be compared. In other words, according to the alignment model, these things have features that don't align. Uh, it's supposed to mean that things cannot be compared. But depending, according to that uh, uh, work that was shown by Medine, sometimes we don't know what features matter. Apples and oranges actually are pretty similar. Uh, they're both round, they're both fruit, uh, they're both edible. It's really just a couple of differences, uh, different color, uh, and one has thicker skin. Uh, so can you think of some other better metaphors? What would the comparisons of apples and oranges tell you? What is that metaphor really trying to get at by asking people to uh, compare two things which are kind of the same, but yet trying to make the point that they can't be compared? Another question I want you to think about, and this has to do with how you might study for things, how do you take advantage of similarity when you're learning new things? Do you try to group similar terms together? Uh, do you study with the same people? Uh, do you try to uncover deeper similarity relationships? Uh, and do you think that helps with recall? Uh, so I want you to think about how you use similarity when you're studying for things. How do you group things together, uh, whether they're concepts, uh, courses, uh, people, those types of things. How do you group things together in order to help you uncover deeper similarity relationships? This idea is going to be important later when we talk about memory and concepts. So thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, remember to uh, complete the discussion question. Uh, if you have any questions about any of this, uh, feel free to email me or message me on the OWL site. Uh, you can also discuss some of this uh, in the uh, YouTube uh, comments as well. Now, YouTube comments will not be part of the course evaluation, but you can certainly make questions or comments there, and I can answer them. Uh, if I get enough similar questions, um, or enough questions that are, uh, I think might be interesting to more than one person, I can put together another short question and answer video. Thanks.